Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we are discussing, we are discussing about the different aspects of the recombinant DNA technology in this particular unit. So far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the general overview of recombinant te DNA technology, its scope and its uh, applications. We have also discussed about how the recombinant DNA technology is being evolved over the course of several uh, decades and uh, we have also discussed about how the different uh, scientists have contributed into the different aspects of the recombinant DNA technology. Now if you recall in the previous two lecture, uh, previous two chapters we have discussed about the host, we have discussed about the vectors, we have discussed about the uh, other kinds of uh, properties and in this particular chapter we are discussing about the different aspects of the gene cloning and if you recall in the previous chap previous lecture I have discussed about how you can be able to isolate the gene of your interest right. So when we were discussing about the gene of interest we have discussed that the, there are three different options which are exist. The options which are existing uh, before the uh, uh, genomic era or the options which are available after the genomic era. So when the genomic sequences are not known then people were identifying the gene of interest simply by preparing a genomic library or the cDNA library depending upon what property of that particular gene they are uh, exploiting. So if they are looking for a DNA fragment which is going to be present in that particular organism or they are looking for the gene corresponding to that gene fragment then they were preparing the genomic library and then sequencing or they, then they were screening the genomic library with the help of the gene fragment as a probe. Uh, similar to that when they were having the expression profiling of a particular protein or when they have the antibodies against a particular protein then they were utilizing the cDNA library. Apart from that when the genomic sequences are known then you can be able to fish out any gene with the help of a technique which is called as polymerase chain reactions. In the previous lecture, we discussed about the polymerase chain reactions in detail. We discussed about how the, uh, the different properties of the uh, polymerase chain reactions. We have discussed about the basic uh, uh, phenomena or basic principles of the polymerase chain reactions and then we also discussed about the, how you can be able to design the primers, how you can be able to perform the uh, polymerase chain reaction and what are different variants of the polymerase chain reaction that is all we have discussed in the previous lectures. Now in today's lecture we are going to discuss about how you can be able to uh, because if you see the, uh, the uh, protocol to generate a recombinant DNA what you will see here is that in the, uh, in the process of uh, developing or generating a recombinant DNA you are going to utilize the multiple types of tools tools in terms of the enzymes or tools in terms of the different types of the uh, additional accessory molecules. So in this particular uh, lecture we are going to discuss about the different types of the enzymes what you are going to use for the gene cloning and how you can be able to what are different properties of these enzymes and how you can be able to utilize these enzymes for performing the different tasks related to gene cloning. Now what you see here is that this is a general overview how you can be able to perform the gene cloning so that you can be able to generate the recombinant DNA. Uh, in this is, uh, scheme what you will see here is that the first enzyme what we are using is a, a polymerase right that we have already discussed that you are going to perform the PCR with the help of the polymerase. Then uh, this uh, fragment what you are going to get the amplified product is going to be digested with the help of the restitution enzymes right. So these are the, so this is the en first enzyme what you are using, this is the second enzyme what you are using, restriction enzyme you are also going to di use to digest the plasmid so that you can actually have the cohesive ends onto the plasmid and as well as you are going to have the cohesive ends onto the gene fragment. 
then you are going to put them into a ligation reaction. So, the third enzyme what you are going to use for gene cloning is ligase and then it is going to be transformed into the bacterial cell and it is going to be screened with the help of the suitable screening criteria. Now, apart from these uh, three uh, uh, enzymes you are also going to use many more enzymes for the specific applications or a specific task which you have to perform when you are going to do the gene cloning. Now, some of the enzymes like the restriction enzymes uh, which you are going to use for the cutting the DNA at a specific site, then you are going to use the polymerases uh, which are going to be used for the PCR amplification of a gene fragment, then you are going to use the alkaline phosphatase this is going to be remove the terminal uh, phosphate group. So, do not worry about this function because this function you will understand when we are going to discuss these enzymes and how these enzymes are useful for performing the gene cloning. Then you also going to use the uh, DNA ligase. So, DNA ligase is being used for the joining of the two DNA strands. Now, first start discussing about the restriction enzymes. So, restriction enzyme is a part of the restriction methylase system what is present in the prokaryotic system. So, this system is present in the uh, prokaryotic uh, system and this is a kind of a immune response what is present in the prokaryotic system and which allows the bacteria to distinguish between the self or the foreign DNA. So, the restriction, methyl restriction methylase system is a system which is present in the prokaryotic system such as bacteria and that is allowing the distinction between the self versus foreign DNA. Okay. So, the precise mechanism of distinction is not known, but based on the available literature in the absence of methylation a closed complex is formed and it allows the proper activation of the cleavage activity of the enzyme, but the presence of methyl group even the hemimethylation on the nucleotide does not allow the formation of the closed complex and consequently the enzyme falls from the DNA. So, this is what exactly it is going to happen. So, you are actually going to have the three forms of DNA. You are going to have the unmethylated DNA, you are going to have unmethylated DNA. Remember that the adenine what is present on to the uh, DNA is going to be methylated. So, it is going to be at the methyl group right so, and because of that it is actually going to protect that DNA from the uh, cleavage activity of the restriction enzyme. So, you are going to have the unmethylated DNA, you are going to have the hemimethylated DNA. So, this is the hemimethylated DNA and then you are going to have the methylated DNA where the methylation would be present on both the fragments. So, these are the methylated fragments. Now, these two DNA are protected from the restriction enzymes action okay? and these two fragments are going to be generated during the replication. This is the DNA what is going to be present in the cell right under the natural conditions when the DNA is going to go for one round of replications, then it is actually going to generate the hemimethylated DNA where the one strand would be coming from the parents and the other strand is going to be the newly formed DNA. And in that case, this newly formed DNA is also going to be methylated later on, but during this phase it is going to be hemimethylated. Whereas, this is the unmethylated DNA and unmethylated DNA is going to be considered as foreign DNA because this is not coming from the uh, host or this is not coming from the person itself because if it is coming from the person it is either going to be hemimethylated or the fully methylated. And this is what it is actually going to give the chance for the bacteria to recognize whether a DNA is coming from the outside or whether the DNA is coming from the inside. So, this is what it is shown here right suppose you are talking about a restriction enzyme which is called as eco R1. So, eco R1 has a recognition site which is called as GAA TTC right and it cuts after the G which means it is going to cut here ok. So, this is and uh, if uh, and so when you treat the DNA which is uh, the unmethylated DNA. So, for example, you have an unmethylated DNA 
Now, what will happen is that it is actually going to cut wherever the cut utilizing its retention site and as a result it is actually going to cleave the DNA and it is actually going to destroy the DNA. So, this is going to be DNA going to be degraded whereas, this is a fully methylated DNA where the methyl group is present on to the adenine. Okay? And in that case what will happen is that recession enzyme uh, eco hormone will not be able to bind the DNA or will not be able to activate its uh, cleavage activity and as a result there will be no DNA degradation and this is what exactly happens when the foreign DNA is going to enter. So, remember that this is foreign DNA because it is unmethylated DNA and it does not have any methylation onto the adenine groups especially the adenine group which are part of the retention site. Okay. So, in that case is it is actually going to be cleaved by the eco R1. Whereas, when the eco R1 methylase is going to put the methyl groups which is also going to be a part of the restation methylase system, it is going to protect this because it does not allow the restation enzyme eco R1 to bind this particular fragment and as a result it cannot generate the cleavage and it is there will be no DNA degradations. How this happens? It happens because the recession methylase system allows the recognition of the multiple recognition sites. So, for example, you can imagine that if you have a DNA and it has a recognition site 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, what will what these enzymes are going to do is they are actually going to recognize the cleavage site. How they are going to do? So, these enzymes are actually having the three uh, uh, subunits, they are going to have M subunit, they are going to have S subunit and they are going to have R subunit. So, this R is actually for restriction, S is for the sequence uh, matching or it is for the recognition actually and the M is for methylation. Okay. Now, what the enzyme is going to do is it is actually going to bind non-specifically to the RE1, RE2, RE3 and RE4. Okay. So, it is actually going to bind this sequence, this sequence, this sequence and this sequence which is present on the DNA. Now, what will happen is it will go and bind to this and it will not be able to convert that into a closed complex which means S will go and bind, but S will not be inserted completely into the DNA. It will go and bind, but the affinity is going to be lower and that is why it will not going to bind. Same is going to be happen for the RE3 and RE4, but when it goes to bind the RE2 because actually that is the retention site. Okay? So, it will go and bind and form the Coles complex. When it is going to form the closed complex, the R subunit is actually going to form a complex with DNA or R uh, subunit will get an axis of the DNA and as a result it is actually going to catalyze the DNA degradation or DNA cleavage and then it is actually going to cleave the DNA utilizing its restriction sites and it is going to generate the DNA fragments. Now, these DNA fragments uh, and once this happens then the restriction enzyme is going to be released from the, uh, from the, uh, from the DNA. So, it is actually a three step process first the recognition of the cleavage sites. So, type 2 restriction enzymes have a specific restriction sequences to rapidly identify the site. The enzyme scans the stretch of DNA through a non-specific interaction and diffusion along the length of DNA. To expedite the recognition process, enzyme does not make interaction with the bases instead of making it contact with the DNA backbone because the backbone is also going to provide the docking site of this enzyme. So, if the docking site is uh, compatible with the enzyme, it is going to bind very strongly. If it does not, then it is actually going to be it removed and it will go and bind to the next site. Then the second point is the binding to the recognition site. Once the recognition site is located, enzyme makes a specific interaction with the nucleotide present at the recognition site via the entry to the major group. Hydrogen bonding, wonder wall interaction play crucial role in this step. Enzyme DNA closed complex formation induce the major conformational change in the restriction enzyme and as a result of this conformational changes, the R subunit 
will come closer to the base pairs and closer to the DNA and because of that it is actually going to catalyze the cleavage reactions. So, a closed complex activates the cleavage activity of the enzyme resulting into the introduction of the DNA break on both the strand to give the fragment with the 3 prime overhang and a 5 prime phosphate groups. Now, restriction methylase system was discovered by the scientist okay, and every bacteria has its own restriction enzyme and because of this diversity in the restriction enzymes, people have started adopting a mechanism how we can be able to give the name to a particular restriction enzyme for example. So, they have come up with the rules how you can going to be the give the name to the restriction enzymes. So, due to the extensive search of presence of restriction enzyme in different microorganisms, a nomenclature system has been adopted. In this system, the first alphabet represents the name of the genus. So, first alphabet is the genus, second alphabet represents the species and third alphabet gives the information about the strain and fourth is the order in which the enzyme is isolated from a particular microorganism. For example, we have an enzyme name which is called as eco R1. So, the first name is eco, the second is R, the third is 1. Okay. So, E is actually eco right, which means it is going to be represent the uh, genus right. So, that is called Escherichia. Then CO which is the coli that is the species. So, it is actually an enzyme which is going to be uh, isolated from a uh, from an enzyme from a bacteria which is called as Escherichia coli. Then the third is R which means it is going to represent the strain. So, it is a strain of RV13 strain and the first is it is the first restriction enzyme from this particular bacteria. This means eco R1 is the first restriction enzyme isolated from the RV13 strain of E. coli. Okay. And that is what the system is being adopted even for the other restriction enzymes like BAMH1, uh, eco R1, HIN3 and so on. Okay. Now, restriction enzymes are of different types. We can have the type 1 restriction enzyme, we can have type 2 restriction enzyme, we can have type 3 restriction enzyme. Type 1 and type 3 restriction enzymes are not cutting the DNA at a precise location that is why they are not being useful for the gene cloning purposes. The recognition site of the type 1 enzyme consists of 3 to 4 nucleotide at 3 prime end followed by a non-specific stretch of 6 to 8 nucleotide and a 4 nucleotide at the 5 prime. The cleavage site is approximately 1000 base pair away from the recognition site and it is presumed that the cleavage follow a DNA translocation enzyme. Uh, so, and the two four factors that is the s adenosyl methionine that is the SAM, ATP and magnesium are required for the full activity of the type 1 enzyme. Uh, type 1 excision enzyme has dual enzymatic activity that means they are actually having the restriction activity and the methylation activity. It is due to the subunit composition of the enzyme three subunit that is the HSDR, HSDM and HSDS to perform the restriction methylation and SDS provide the specificity to the recognizing a DNA sequence. Then type 3 restriction enzyme, the recognition sequence has two separate non palindromic sequences arranged inversely oriented. The cutting site is 20 to 30 base pair away from the recognition site. So, this is very important that cutting site is very very far away and it is unpredictable uh, where it is actually going to cut uh, after recognizing this particular recognition site. The type 3 restriction enzyme is composed of two subunit that is the RES and the MOD. The MOD e subunit is required for the modification of the host DNA whereas the RES subunit cuts the unmethylated DNA. So, type uh, 1 and type 3 both are useless as far as the gene cloning is concerned because they will actually going to recognize uh, for a particular sequence and they will going to cut at a distance site, they were not going to cut within the recognition site. Then we have the type 2 restriction enzyme. So, type 2 restriction enzymes are useful for the gene cloning. The recognition site, so recognition site of type 2 enzyme is 4 to 8 nucleotide long and it cuts the DNA within the specific site and because of this feature only the type 2 restriction enzymes are 
useful because you know that it is going to recognize this particular sequence and it is going to cut within this sequence. Due to this feature, the type 2 recession enzyme have application in genetic engineering for the cloning purpose. It is composed of three subunit M, R and S. The type 2 recession enzymes are of diversified nature and further classified due to the unique feature of this class. For example, you can have type 2 E, you can have type 2 B and you can have type 2 M. So, this is a just a uh, uh, comparison of the uh, all the three classes type 1, type 2 and type 3. Uh, major difference is that the recognition site, the recognition site is going to be non palindromic in both the cases that is the type 1 and type 3 where it is going to be palindromic in the case of type 2. Now, what is mean by the palindromic that I think I will discuss in a subsequent uh, slides. Then cutting site, cutting site is 1000 base pair away from the site of recognitions, whereas it is going to be 20 to 25 base pair away from the site of recognitions, whereas in the type 2 it is within the recognition site. Similarly, the enzyme composition, enzyme composition is different for the type 1, type 2 and type 3. Then the cofactors, cofactors like magnesium, SAM and ATP is required for the type 1. Uh, ATP is required for the type 3 whereas magnesium is required for the type 2. Products you are going to have the non sticky end product in the case of uh, type 1 and type 3 whereas you are going to have the type 2 that is the sticky end. So, what is mean by the sticky end? What is mean by the palindromic sequences that we are going to discuss in our subsequent slides. So, what is mean by the uh, palindromic sequences or what are the different properties of the recognition site, the type 2 recognition site enzyme because of which it is very, very popular to be utilized for the uh, gene cloning. First is it is going to be have the palindromic sequences as a recognition site. So, the recognition sequence of the type 2 recognition enzyme is palindromic in nature. It means that the sequence readout would be same in forward and the reverse direction. Okay. I have taken an example of BAMH1. Okay. So, this is an example of the uh, BAMH1 where the recognition site is GGATTC. Okay. So, what you cite, what you write is GGATTC. Okay. So, this is one DNA, right? This is uh, 5 prime, this is the 3 prime. Now, I will if I will write the complementary DNA. So, it will cite C, C, T, A, A, G. Okay. Now, you see the beauty of this particular sequence. If you read from this side to this side, okay, if you read this sequence from this side, okay, uh, sorry, uh, this is A, T, C, uh, T, C, C. So, this is going to be G. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if you read this sequence okay, in this direction, so what we are going to read G G A. Now, if you read this sequence in this direction also, right? this is the 5 prime. right? So, if you read the sequence from the 5 prime end, okay, again the same sequence G G A. Now, if you see this side, right? so it is going to be T C C. This means 5 prime end T C C. Similarly, T C C. So, if I read this sequence in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction, the sequence read as identical, which means G G A T C C. Similarly, G G A T C C. So, this kind of sequences are called as palindromic sequences, which you can read in uh, forward direction or the reverse direction, they, 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 they read the same. Okay. So, uh, this is just an example of the MAMH1. If you take the example of uh, the uh, even the eco R1 or other restriction enzymes, it, so and and I, th I think it is a very good activity or good exercise that you go through with the some of the restriction uh, sequences of the other restriction enzyme, and you, you see that all the sequences are going to be palindromic in nature. Which means if you read in the river forward direction or if you read in the reverse direction, they are actually going to be same. Then the second is sticky ends, it is going to generate the sticky end. The type 2 recession enzyme cut the DNA strand together to generate DNA with the hanging DNA strand of 
four to six nucleotide. These DNA stretch containing fragments are cohesive to each other as sequence present on the complex one will be complementary to the sequence present on the complex two. Now, again you take an example, right? So I have taken an example of this, right? So this is the BAMH one, right? And this is five prime. This is three prime. And again, three prime. I will be like C C T A G G. Now, where it is going to cut? It is going to cut just after the G, which means it is going to cut at just after the G. So, if it is cutting here, right? If it is cutting here, then it is actually going to generate a DNA sequence like this. Okay. So this is going to be come, cut out. Similarly, if it is going to cut like this, it is going to generate this sequence. Okay. So, with this fragment, it is going to have G and then it is going to have an overwang. For this fragment, okay, it is going to have a G on this side and it is going to have this. So, you see here, right? you are going to have an overhang of this and you are going to have a complementary overhang onto the next strand. Okay, this means, and if you put, if you don't do anything, right? If you just leave these, it will actually going to come back, and this C is actually going to have an affinity for this G. This T is going to have an affinity for this A, and this A is going to have an affinity for this T, and this G is going to have an affinity for this C. This means they are actually going to have the tendency to bind each other. Now you can imagine that if I if I cut the another fragment with the same enzyme, then what will happen? It is going to generate the complementary sequence. It is going to generate a complementary sequence, right? And this portion is actually going to be this portion, and this portion is going to be this portion in that particular fragment, okay? So, for example, if I have generated a gene and I had cut the gene with the same set of DNA, then what will happen is that it is going to generate this sequence at this site and this sequence at this site. And as a result, this particular fragment will very even very eventually will fit into this particular sequence into this particular DNA, right. So, imagine that if this is a plasmid right if this is a plasmid and this is a fragment it is actually going to allow the circularization of this plasmid and as a result it is going to be used for the gene cloning purposes imagine that if i if i don't have these sticky ends then it is going to be very very difficult to form the hydrogen bonding and to hold this particular fragment into this so it is like a juxta puzzle what you have probably have done in in your childhood right that you are fitting the two different types of blocks. So, the blocks which are complemented to each other will fit very nicely, right? Similarly to this, right? You are cutting the gene with the same set of enzymes, you are cutting the plasmid also the same set of enzyme and that is how you are actually going to have the complementity of this fragment for this particular fragment and this fragment for this particular fragment and as a result it is actually going to have the uh, a spontaneous affinity for each other to fit this, right? Now, how you are going to set up the restriction reactions, right? So, you actually require the restriction enzymes, you require the DNA, you require the buffers, and you can require actually all other kinds of things. So, what you require? You require the DNA, right? You require the restriction enzymes. So, normally, what restriction enzyme you are going to buy in your in our lab, right? It is at, at a uh, concentration of 20,000 units per ml. Then you actually require the buffers, and you also require the PSA. You require the sterile water, and you require the uh, total volume. So total volume should be high, so that you should have enough water molecules to facilitate the uh, the cleavage reactions. How you are going to uh, set up the reactions? So what you are going to do is you are going to take the water molecule first, right? So, first you are going to take the water molecule, then you are going to add the buffer, then you are going to add the BSA, then you are going to add the DNA and lastly you are going to add the restriction enzyme as per the quantity of the DNA. For 1 microgram DNA, uh, you are actually going to put 0.5 to 10 units per reactions. 
but and accordingly to the number of amount of DNA you are putting you can actually be able to increase the amount of repetition enzymes into this particular microliter. Keeping in mind that the the glycerol what is present in your enzyme should not be more than 10 percent okay because if it is more than 10 percent then the enzymes will not going to show you the accurate type 2 detection enzyme activity and in that case it may actually show you the star activity. So, in that case it is actually going to show you the star activity star what is mean by the star activity it is our activity is called as aberrant restriction enzyme activity which is actually the scope uh, beyond the scope of uh, the discussion, uh, but what will what will be saying that suppose the repetition enzyme is cutting at this particular uh, sequence right after the G. If you are actually keeping the more amount of glycerol then it may not cut here, it may cut here, it may cut here, it may cut at, at a random location. So, in that cases it is not going to give you the cohesive ends, it, it may not recognize the palindromic sequences and so on. Now, let us move on to the next enzyme and the next enzyme is a ligase okay. and then what is the purpose of a ligase? Uh, ligase purpose is joining the two DNA fragment to generate the chimeric DNA on the basis of cloning. It is an essential step to generate the cloned uh, containing foreign DNA in a vector. When cohesive ends generated by the action of tritian endonuclease on the enzyme DNA associated with the NIC remain to be sealed and give the complete circular DNA, right. Remember that uh, if you have this, right, sorry, uh, even if you put the complementary DNA, right, there will be a NIC which is going to be sealed, okay. So, what the DNA ligase is doing? It is an enzyme which requires the ATP or the NAD plus as a cofactor to catalyze the ligation reaction. And what ligation is doing? It is actually uh, you know forming a phosphodiester bond because of that it is actually going to form a close the NIC. So, ligase is, a, is processing ATP to generate the AMP and then AMP is making an adduct within enzyme to form the ligase AMP complex. This complex is binding to the 3 prime and 5 prime of the DNA bearing the NIC and bringing them together. AMP is released and the phosphodiester linkage is formed between the 3 prime and 5 prime end to seal the NIC. This is exactly what it is actually going to do, right. When you are going to put the reactions, what you are going to do is you are going to put the uh, enzyme. So, you can actually have the two different types of enzyme either the 2E4 DNA ligase or the E. coli DNA ligase. So, E. coli DNA ligase normally uses the NAD plus as a cofactor whereas the T4 DNA ligase which is a ligase from the uh, uh, from the viruses is using the ATP as a uh, cofactor. So, in that case what will happen is that enzyme is going to form the enzyme AMP complex. So, ATP is going to be broken down, it is going to generate the AMP plus PPI and that AMP is going to form the complex with the enzyme then the AMP is going to be. Uh, so, you see that there is a NIC here right there is a OH and a phosphate on this side, but the linkage is not being formed ok. So, that linkage is going to be formed by forming the AMP on this side and bringing them together right. Once you bring them together then the phosphodiester linkage is going to be formed between this and AMP is going to be released and the phosphodiester linkage is going to be formed and now the DNA is intact it is not having the any kind of NICs or any kind of breakage. This is what exactly the ligase reaction is doing. So, you are actually having the, uh, the cohesive ends onto the, whole, onto the gene fragment, you have the cohesive ends onto the vector and then both the sides, the 5 prime side and as well as the 3 prime side, you are going to have the 2 NICs where the OH and P is present. So, what the enzyme is doing, it is actually uh, uh, utilizing the AMP and bringing them together and then the once they come very close to each other the AMP comes out and then the OH is making a nucleophilic attack onto the phosphate group and as a result it is forming a bond with the phosphate and as a result the phosphodiester linkage is going to be formed. Now, how you are going to set up the ligase reactions? So, uh, ligase reactions are going to be set up between a vector and the insert, right. 
normally we are keeping a ratio of vector to insert as 1 is to 3. So, in that case like you take the 1 microgram of vector and 3 microgram of vector as uh, insert. Then you are going to put the ligase, so T4 DL ligase. So, remember that T4 DL ligase requires ATP, whereas if you are using the E. coli ligase, you are also supposed to put the NAD plus. Then we require the ligase buffer, so you are going to put the ligase buffer and then you are also going to put the BSA, sterile water and the total volume should be 20 microliter. Remember that in the restation enzyme reactions, we have kept the total volume as 50 microliter because we want the more and more water molecules so that the cleavage reaction should be proceed very smoothly. Whereas, in the case of ligation reactions, we should keep the ligation reaction as small so that the molecules should react with each other at a because you want to increase the molecular crowding, right. So, in this case what you have to do is you take the water molecules, you take the BSA, you take the buffer, right. Then you add the vector and insert, right. So, then you add the vector. Uh, you take add the insert, then you add the T4 DL ligase and then you set up these reaction at 16 degree Celsius for uh, 18 hours. It's okay. So, why are we doing the 16 hours? So, that the molecular uh, crowding will be there, but molecules should not have the sufficient amount of uh, the energy, so that they should be keep you know running here and there. They should not move and be, once they will not move, they will allow the vector and the insert to react with each other and as a result they will allow the ligase to form the ligase in this uh, phosphodiester linkage and as a result they are actually going to give you the circular DNA. Now, the next enzyme is alkaline phosphatase. So, alkaline phosphatase is also called as SIP or cock intestinal alkaline phosphatase. So, alkaline phosphatase is an important enzyme in several organisms from the bacteria to human. Physiologically, alkaline phosphatase has lot of function including the bone formation, liver formation and intestinal health. In molecular biology, its catalytic activity is used to remove the terminal phosphate group from the fiber and end of the DNA strands. Typically, the cock intestinal alkaline phosphatase is used for all the molecular biology applications. Now, what is the structure of the uh, SIP? So, cock intestinal alkaline phosphatase is a monomeric enzyme with a molecular weight of approximately 70 kDa. The enzyme contain a zinc finger binding site essential for its catalytic activity. It typically has two zinc ions per molecule which is crucial for maintaining the structure and the function. It has a magnesium binding site that further stabilizes the enzyme and enhances its activity. The active site of SIP contains serine residues vital for its phosphatase activity. This residue participate directly into the dephosphorylation reactions. Now, what is the uh, biochemical reaction of the alkaline phosphatase? So, biochemical reaction it is going to have the binding and the activation, the nucleophilic attack and then it is going to have the uh, you know. So, why we are doing the alkaline phosphatase on or the SIP reactions? Because when you are using only one restriction enzyme, okay, when you are using the one restriction enzyme rather than the combination uh, instead of combination. Okay. So, when you are doing a gene cloning reactions, you can actually have the possibility of using the two restriction enzyme. One for the 5 prime end. For example, in this case I will use the PMH1 for the 5 prime end and I will use the HIN3 okay, for 3 prime end. In that case you do not require the SIP because the vector will have the 5 prime end uh, sequences overhang different than the vector hint. But suppose in so this is scenario number 1. If the scenario number 2 what I will do is I will only use the BAMH1. Okay. Now, if I use the BAMH1 alone, right, then what will happen is that if I am when I am digesting the uh, vector with the BAMH1 alone, then the overhang on the 5 prime side and overhang on to the 3 prime side is going to be same. So, in that case, what will happen is that uh, the 5 prime end will find the cognate 3 prime end and 3 prime end will find the. So, 
in this vector which is not having the insert. So, there is no insert right in this vector there is no insert even then it will ligate and it will give you the circular plasmid which is actually going to even give you the selection also. So, this is actually going to be false positive whereas, uh, if I have an insert which is also digested with BAMH1 and the, what will uh, what I will do is I will actually going to treat the insert with a sip. Okay. So, uh, in that case what will happen is that only the insert is actually will go and fit into this and it is actually going to allow the ligation reaction of this and that is how it is actually going to perform. So, why we are doing the sip because we are using the single enzyme and in that case what we are doing is we are treating the vector with the, um, uh, the, uh, the coctimus uh, uh, alkaline phosphatase and uh, as a result what it has what it has done is it has removed this 5 prime phosphate. So, if there will be no 5 prime phosphate it is only have 5 prime OH right you see that 5 prime OH on both the side it cannot recircularize and if you it cannot recircularize it will not be able to give you the false positive. So, when you add the insert right it insert has 5 prime phosphate insert have 5 prime phosphate. So, insert will actually compensate the losses what you have insert what you have introduced into the uh, vector and as a result it is actually going to allow the recircularization of this plasmid and will giving you the circular recombinant DNA. So, what you are going to do is you are going to have the binding and activation the substrate a phosphate ester which is DNA binds to the active site of the SIP the enzyme has a I affinity for the phosphate group a nucleophilic serine residue in the active site of SIP attack the phosphate uh, atom of the phosphate group onto the substrate. This step is facilitated by the presence of zinc in the active site which stabilize the transition state and polarize the active phosphate group. Then it is actually going to have the formation of phosphoserine intermediate. So, this nucleophilic attack forms a covalent phosphoserine intermediate and release the dephosphorylated substrate. Then there will be a water molecule attack. So, a water molecule attack by the enzyme attack the phosphate group of the phosphoserine intermediate resulting in the release of the inorganic phosphate which means the phosphate group which is present onto the 5 prime end of the insert is going to be released and then the dephosphorylated substrate and the inorganic phosphates are released from the enzyme which is now ready to catalyze the another reaction cycle. Now, how you are going to set up the alkaline phosphate reaction? So, you are going to have the uh, SIP reaction buffers, you are going to have the enzyme, you are going to have the vector where you have the 5 prime uh, phosphate and then you are also going to have the SIP stop solutions. How you are going to set up the reactions? So, in the step 1 you are going to prepare the master mix with the following reactions. You are going to have the DNA, you are going to have the 10 x reaction buffers, you are going to have the uh, enzyme. Uh, okay. So, and then the incubate the 50 microliter reaction for 30 minutes, then you are going to have another 8 5 microliter uh, sip should be added and incubated at 30, uh, 30 minutes. Then you add the 300 microliter of the uh, reaction stop, stop solution and extract the nucleic acid by the phenol chloroform extraction methods. Now, we will move on to the next reaction next enzyme and the next enzyme is polynucleotide kinase. Polynucleotide kinase you might have heard when we were talking about the preparation of the radioactive uh, uh, probes right. So, polynucleotide kinase is an enzyme that play key role in repairing and the manipulating the nucleic acid. It is found in the various organisms including bacteria, viruses and eukaryotes. The T4 bacteriophage polynucleotide kinase is generally being used into the molecular biology. PNK attacks the phosphate group to the 5 prime end. It has the reverse effect of alkaline phosphatase adding the phosphate group onto the free termini. Magnesium acts as a cofactor for the its enzyme and it is crucial for its activity. Now, what is the structure of the polynucleotide kinase? So, T4 polynucleotide kinase is a monomeric enzyme with a molecular weight of 33 kilo Dalton. It has two major uh, functional domains kinase domain and as well as the phosphatase domain. The kinase domain is located at the end terminal of the region it is catalyzing a 
gamma phosphate uh, from the ATP to the 5 from hydroxyl terminal of the nucleic acid. This means it is going to catalyze the DNA uh, phosphorylations. Similarly, the phosphatase domain, so PNK also has a phosphatase domain that removes the phosphate group from the nucleotide 3 prime terminals. What is the biochemical reactions? So, biochemical reactions it is going to first going to have the substrate binding, then ATP binding, then nucleophilic attacks and then there will be a transfer of the phosphate group from the enzyme to the, uh, to the DNA and then it is actually going to have the uh, release of the product. So, this is the T4 DNA ligase, uh, you are going to have the 5 prime OH and you are going to have 3 prime OH, you are going to if you add the enzyme it is going to transfer the phosphate onto the 5 prime group. So, the 5 prime hydroxyl end of the nucleic acid bind to the kinase domain of the polyneutrotide kinase, ATP binds to the active side of the kinase domain, magnesiums are often required to stabilize the ATP and the active side conformations. Then there will be a uh, uh, serine or the threonine which is present onto the kinase domain initiates a nucleophilic attack onto the gamma phosphate of the ATP. Then the gamma phosphate is transferred from the ATP to the 5 prime hydroxyl group of the nucleic acid forming a 5 prime phosphorylated nucleic acid. ADP is released as a byproduct and then the once the phosphorylated products are being generated the phosphorylated product is released from the enzyme completing the reaction cycle. Now, if you want to perform these reactions, uh, you are supposed to have the following components. You require the T4 DNA reaction buffers, you require the DNA, you require the ATP, you require the T4 PNA like uh, enzyme and then you also require the nuclease free water. Uh, you prepare the reaction buffer as the following table, you are going to have the DNA, you are going to have the buffer, then enzyme, then ATP and uh, if you want to label some DNA instead of ATP, you can actually have the ATP where the phosphate is going to be radio labeled. Then you incubate the reaction mixture at 37 degrees Celsius uh, and the total reaction volume will be 50 microliter. Stop the reaction by adding the 2 microliter of 0.5 millimolar ADTA and purify the phosphorylated DNA using the phenol chloroform extraction. In some cases, people also use the gel filtration chromatography. Now, let us move on to the next enzyme, and the next enzyme is called as terminal deoxynucleotide transferase. So, terminal deoxynucleotide transferase is an enzyme that plays a crucial role in the immune system, especially in developing the lymphocytes. Terminal deoxynucleotide transferase is a DNA polymerase that add nucleotide onto the 3 prime of the DNA polymer molecules without a template. This activity is essential for the diversity of the immune receptor. This enzyme can add similar nucleotide residue to form a homopolymer tail on the 3 prime of the DNA strand. Unlike most DNA polymerases, it does not require a template. Terminal deoxynucleotide transferase is expressed in immature pre-B and pre-T uh, lymphocytes. It is a marker for these cells and it is used to diagnostically to identify the specific type of leukemia. High level of terminal deoxynucleotide are found in the thymus and bone marrow. Structure of the terminal deoxynucleotide transferase. Uh, so, TTD is composed of a single polynucleotide. Uh, peptide chain typically contains 510 to 580 amino acid in length depending upon the species. The core structure of the TDD is like that all other DNA polymerases, it has the three key structures. It has the N terminal domain, it has the C terminal domain and then it has the loop structures. So, N terminal domain is involved in the DNA binding and it is essential for the DNA interaction with the 3 prime end of the uh, DNA strands. The C terminal region contains the polymerase uh, domain. This region is responsible for the addition of the nucleotide to the DNA strand. This region is structurally conserved among the DNA polymerases. Then it has a loop structure that has not been found in template dependent polymerases. These loops are thought to accommodate the single standard DNA and contribute to the enzyme's ability to add the nucleotide without a template. So, this is the biochemical reaction what it is going to catalyze. So, if you have a single standard DNA and then you if you incubate that single standard DNA with the terminal D transferase uh, in the help of the uh, DNTPs, 
then it is actually going to add that onto the 3 prime end and it is actually going to form the polymer. So, this is going to if really uh, you know so this cycle continues. So, in the one cycle it is going to add the one nucleotide then if this con cycle will continue for a longer period of time then it is actually going to add that particular nucleotide for a very very long length. So, in the first uh, it is going to bind the substrate. So, terminal denoxy nucleotide transferase binds to the single standard or double standard DNA molecule with the 3 prime hydroxyl group as end right. So, TDD binds to DNTPs which are also the substrate for the nucleotide addition. So, 3 prime end is going to be free and then it also going to bind the DNTPs within the active site. Then it is going to perform the catalysis. So, it catalyzes the formation of a phosphodiester bond between the 3 prime hydroxyl group of the DNA and the 5 prime phosphate group of the incoming DNTPs. This process is repeated adding the multiple nucleotide to the 3 prime end of the phosphate unlike other DNA polymerases. Terminal deoxynucleotide does not require a template strand to guide the incorporation in the nucleotide. It adds the nucleotide randomly based on the availability of the DNTPs. How you are going to set up the reactions? So, for the setting of this reaction components, you require the buffers, you require the enzymes, you require the DNA substrate or you require the DNTPs. So, depending upon what DNTP you want to add like what nucleotide, you can actually be able to keep all the that particular nucleotide. For example, if I want to add the poly uh, A chain, then I can just keep the DATPs. And this is the, uh, um, the way you are going to set up the reactions. So, you are going to prepare the master mix, right. So, you are going to have the DNA, you are going to have the 10 X buffer, you are going to have an enzyme, you are going to have DNTPs and you are going to have the nucleus P water. So, that your total reaction volume would be 50 microliter. Then you mix the reaction mix component via gentle vortexing the incubator reaction mixture at 37 degrees for 30 to 60 R minutes. Stop the reaction using the EDTA and purify the DNA using the phenol chloroform extractions. Then the next enzyme is poly A polymerase. So, you remember that poly A polymerase is uh, adding the uh, poly A tail right to the uh, messenger RNA right. So, poly A polymerase is an extremely important post translational modification enzyme. It adds the adenine residue to form a poly A tail at the 3 prime hydroxyl group of the RNA. The poly A tail is of extreme importance for the stability and export of the messenger RNA. Poly A polymerase is also template independent just like the terminal deoxynucleotide transferase. It uses the ATP as a source of adenine which is incorporated at the 3 prime hydroxyl group of the RNA. What is the structure of uh, poly A polymerase? So, poly A polymerase is an enzyme with a well characterized structure important for its function in messenger RNA processing. It consists of the single polypeptide chain and has several distinct domains. So, it has N terminal domain, it has the polymerase domain and it has the C terminal domain. The domain, uh, so, so N terminal domain that is contains of the RNA recognition motif involved into the recognition and binding to the pre messenger RNA. Then we have a polymerase domain, the central part of the enzyme is responsible for the catalytic activity of the enzyme. This domain shares the structural resemblance with the other nucleotide transferases. The active site is located within the polymerase domain, binding and catalyzes the nucleotide addition. This domain consists of the regulatory domain which controls the activity of the PAP. It also contains a nuclear localization signal that helps transport the protein to the nucleus where it catalyzes the addition of the poly A tail. Then poly biochemical reactions, uh, poly A polymerase uh, is going to uh, add the poly uh, DNTPs or the DATPs actually onto the 3 prime end and as a result it is actually going to form this particular messenger RNA. So, it is first going to bind the substrate. So, it is going to PAP binds to the 3 prime end of the pre messenger RNA. The RNA step substrate usually has a cleavage end generated by the action of other factor in the for the adenylation complex, PAPs bind to the ATP and the donor of the adenine residue and it will be added to the messenger RNA. Then it is going to catalyze the reactions. So, PAP catalyzes the formation of the phosphodiester bond between the RNA's 3 prime end as well as the uh, 5 prime phosphate of the ATP. This process uh, add one adenine residue to the 3 prime end of the RNA. Unlike many other polymerases, PAP does not require a template strand to guide the addition of nucleotide. 
it adds the adenine residue in a template independent manner. Then there will be a processivity. The PAP can add multiple adenine residues sequentially to the 3 prime end of the messenger RNA resulting in a poly A tail. The length of poly A tail can vary, but it is typically between 200 to 250 nucleotide in the eukaryotic messenger RNA. So, once you have actually this is going to be uh, mature messenger RNA and that messenger RNA is going to participate into the downstream translation. Now, how you are going to set up the reactions for this particular reaction uh, enzyme? So, you require the purified uh, RNA, you require the enzyme, you require the ATP and you require the buffers. So, first you are going to prepare the master mix with the following components. So, you are going to have the RNA, you are going to have the buffers, you are going to have the enzyme, you are going to have the ATP and the final uh, volume would be 50 micro, uh, uh, 20 microliter. Then you incubate the reaction mixture at 37 degrees Celsius for, uh, uh, for 1 minutes uh, for 1 hour. Stop the reaction using the EDTA and extract the RNA by the phenol chloroform extraction following by the uh, uh, ethanol precipitations. So, uh, this is all about the different types of enzyme what we have uh, going to be used in the gene cloning. So, we have discussed about the polymerases. So, we have discussed about the uh, restriction enzymes, we have discussed about the ligases, we have discussed about the alkaline phosphatases, we have discussed about the terminal transferases and then we also discussed about the poly A polymerases. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss some more aspects related to gene cloning. Thank you.